Well, good evening or afternoon or morning whenever you're having to, having a chance to watch this. This is our Bible study for Wednesday, February the 2nd, 2022. So it's 2222. And uh, of course, as you can see, I'm back, back out on the uh, church property. A lot of things have happened and uh, taken place uh, since last time I was able to record out here. Uh, but wanted to come out today, and uh, this is actually a uh, Wednesday morning, uh, the second, so when I'm recording. And uh, you can see some piles of dirt, of course, is uh, getting ready to be spread uh, once they uh, grade the parking area, and that'll be kind of on the, on the bottom before they bring in the asphalt. But uh, a lot of things happening on the inside as well, and you'll get to see that. Uh, with the uh, praying on the property tomorrow or if you'd like to come out sometime just let us know we'd be happy to meet you out here but uh, we are in Judges chapter 5 we have reached the song of Deborah uh, in our Bible study through Judges so last time we saw how God delivered his people uh, from the Canaanites through Deborah and Barak and uh, we saw what all took place with that and how he um, had Israel overpower uh, Sisera and the 900 iron chariots. And uh, we're gonna see in, in the Song of Deborah uh, more how uh, God uh, used the weather to help in that and help conquer. But uh, this is Hebrew poetry, okay? And this is kind of a lengthy section. We're gonna look at the whole chapter uh, just because I think that probably the easiest to do, but it may, may take us a little bit longer. So I'll. I'll try to go through it as fast as I can, but, uh, but I think it's best to take it in sections. Usually, you know, I like to read the entire passage and then go back and look at the sections uh, of the uh, scriptures that we are doing. But tonight, uh, I want to just go through and as we go through each section, instead of reading the entire chapter, which is 30 verses, I think it might be easier and uh, just work better as we go through to explain and and go through the uh, as much of the exact meaning we can find of course with it being poetry uh there's some there's, there's some imagery in there figurative language different things that come into play but pretty much it stays true to what actually has taken place um so let's uh go ahead and and begin with a word of prayer and then we're going to get into into the word so let's pray father thank you so much for the day you've given us the opportunity we have to come to together and to study your word together i pray that you will uh just guide us through this as we look at uh, the song of deborah give us understanding lord not only of of uh, why it was written why it's in your word but how it applies to our lives as well i pray that you will uh, just help me die to myself so that you, your spirit is able to fill me and use me as, in the way that you desire and speak through me uh, and all the, that I have prepared, Lord, may it be exactly what you want us to hear. And I pray for all of us, Lord, myself and all those who are uh, studying along with me as they watch this, Lord, that you will search our hearts afresh and anew. If there's any unclean way in us, Lord, reveal that sin to us so that we can confess that sin, ask for your forgiveness, and be cleansed from all unrighteousness through the precious blood of Jesus. We thank you for doing that for us, God. And now as we go through this study, give us understanding. Draw us closer to yourself and give us the understanding of how um, this word uh, applies to our lives and how we can learn from it and... Uh, learn more about you and grow closer to you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, once again, glad you're with me. And uh, when, when they wanted to celebrate the Jewish people uh, or special occasions and things, Jesus, Jewish people often express themselves in a song. Okay, So the writer shifts here uh, in Judges from narrative prose to jubilant poetry. Now, future generations might forget a history book, what they learn in history book, but they're less likely to forget a song, okay? And a lot of times even memorizing scripture, when you put it to a tune, uh, it helps you remember that scripture verse a little more. Unlike classical English poetry, Hebrew poetry contains recurring themes and, and expressed in different ways 
and then there's frequent outbursts of praise and prayer. So it's a little different than uh, some of the poetry we may have studied in school and different things like that. Uh, but uh, we're going to look at that tonight, and that's what the Song of Deborah is. In verse 1, it says, you can follow along with me. I'm again reading from New American Standard. Judges chapter 5, beginning in verse 1, says, Then Deborah and Barak, the son of Abinoam, sang on that day, saying, okay, this is the introduction of the song, okay? It sounds as if it is by Deborah and Barak, but as we get into the text itself, it becomes more apparent that it is Deborah's song, especially with the personal pronouns that are used. But Barak was probably there with her, along with several others, uh, in, in, in sharing this celebration. And when we get to verse 2, we start the actual song. That the leaders led in Israel, that the people volunteered, bless the Lord. Hear, O kings, give ear, O rulers. I, to the Lord, I will sing. I will sing praise to the Lord, the God of Israel. Now, Deborah and Barak were the leaders uh, of the people. Okay, Deborah was the judge. Barak was the uh, head of the army. And they led as God led them. All right. And then there were 10,000 volunteers from Naphtali and Zebulun, okay, and some others, but those are the two main ones. Now, remember, these are not trained, not professional warriors. These are simply volunteers, okay? And then she says, bless the Lord. Praise be to God for providing the leaders and providing the volunteers as well, the 10,000 volunteers. And God, we remember as we saw last week, God was the one that defeated the enemy. And that's going to be brought up again and again uh, throughout not only this song, but also throughout Judges. He's the one that actually brings the defeat on the enemies, brings the victory to Israel. Now, it's reminded that some trust in chariots and some in horses, but Israel chose to trust in the Lord. And we can look back at Psalm 20, verse 7, and see that. Now, then, then she mentions the kings of the earth need to listen. This is what the Lord Almighty did, and he is the one to be praised for that. Therefore, if he did it for his people, he, if you come against his people, he will do this against you as well. And Deborah says, I will sing praise to the Lord, the God of Israel. It's her declaration of serving and trusting in the Lord. I am going to praise him. I'm going to sing to him because he is my God. He is the one that has brought us this victory. And I'm going to praise him for that. And in doing so, it's, it serves also as a warning to anyone that would oppose them. Would be opposing God himself. So you have to be careful. As we continue into verse 4. Lord, when you went out from Seir, when you marched from the field of Edom, the earth quaked, the heavens also dripped, even the clouds dripped water. The mountains quaked at the presence of the Lord. This Sinai at the presence of the Lord, the God of Israel. Deborah here is recounting the work that God has done for Israel, depicting Yahweh as a mighty warrior marching forth from Seir or Edom to come to the aid of his people. Now, Seir is, was a mountain in Edom to the south of Israel. And then Sinai was a mountain, Mount Sinai, was even further south and was the place where the Lord first revealed himself to Israel. And having become their God at Mount Sinai, when he and they entered that covenant, he then led them from the south through Seir and Edom to the promised land, the place where the present victory took place. Now, this song praises the Lord because his most recent victory had just demonstrated to Israel that he was still active and powerful on their behalf. Now, notice the reaction of the various parts of creation to the Creator. The earth trembled, the heavens dripped, the clouds dripped. This undoubtedly takes on added significance in that the false god of the Canaanites, Baal, was envisioned by them as the storm god, okay? But Jehovah 
shows who is the true living storm God uh, in, in this and what he does. Now she continues showing how the created knows its creator. Verse five, the earth quaked. And one thing to note about verse four, the heavens and clouds dripped, meaning it was raining. Now that significance is gonna be seen later in the poem. As we continue with the text in verse six, in the days of Shamgar, the son of Anath, in the days of Jael, the highways were deserted and travelers went by roundabout ways. The peasantry ceased. They ceased in Israel until I, Deborah, arose, until I arose a mother in Israel. New gods were chosen. Then war was in the gates. Not a shield or a spear was seen among 40,000 in Israel. This suggests that the usual routes back in verse six, traveled by caravans and individuals were vacated out of fear of attack by the Canaanites. Now, I referenced this when we looked at Shamgar back at the end of chapter three, uh, because again, it says in the days of Shamgar, so it, it's helping them out. And then it says, and the travers went about roundabout ways. This describes Israel's pre-war state that existed because of her rejection of her king, the Lord. Now instead, they chose evil and wickedness in the place of purity and holiness and a decline in the social and moral life of a nation is inevitable consequence of a nation's spiritual decline. So that's gonna happen. You spiritually go bad, everything else is gonna fall apart. There were no mighty men of valor to fight, okay? That's the peasantry cease, the, the, the order of things of, of, of mighty men, warriors. Uh, there weren't any that were there until Deborah was raised up as judge of Israel. Now she served as that leader of Israel and she was a mother in Israel protecting and guiding them, okay? And serving in that capacity. Now, unfortunately we see in verse eight again that Israel had turned to idolatry. And because of this, their punishment was war with the Canaanites and the Canaanites uh, oppressing them for many years. Yet they had no weapons for war themselves. Israel was not prepared. Uh, remember, we don't, they didn't have the mighty men, they didn't have the warriors, so they were easy prey for the Canaanites. Verse nine, my heart goes out to the commanders of Israel, the volunteers among the people, Bless the Lord. You who ride on white donkeys, you who sit on rich carpets, and you who travel on the road, sing. At the sound of those who divide flocks among the watering places, there they shall recount the righteous deeds of the Lord, the righteous deeds for his peasantry in Israel. Then the Lord, people of the Lord went down to the gates. Awake, awake, Deborah, awake, awake, sing a song. Arise, Barak, and take away your captives, O son of, of Abinoam. Then survivors came down to the nobles. The people of the Lord came down to me as warriors. Now this is a celebratory section, <coughs> pardon me, of the poem, praising God, okay? It is the turnaround spot for Israel. God has mercy on his people and sends help in the form of Deborah, Barak, and the 10,000 volunteers. Now, the call came out to all people, rich and poor, to come together under the Lord's leadership. Then in verse 11, there is a recounting of how God was mighty for Israel in the past, what he had done for the people of the Lord. Awake means to arouse or to stir up. Now, here is when God calls out to Deborah to be ready to receive the word of the Lord, and to lead out. To get Barak, the leader of, the, of Israel's army, and to get the volunteers gathered to become God's warriors. The survivors are those who had survived the oppression of Jabin, king of the Canaanites. Those, who, the, the, those, uh, that one who has been oppressing them for all these years. Now, as we continue in verse 14, from Ephraim, those who whose root is in Amalek came down, following you, Benjamin, with your peoples. From Maker, commanders came down, and from Zebulun, those who wield the staff of office. And the princes of Issachar, 
were with Deborah, as was Issachar, so was Barak. Into the valley they rushed at his heels. Among the divisions of Reuben there were great resolves of heart. Why did you sit among the sheepfolds to hear the piping for the flocks? Among the divisions of Reuben there were great searchings of heart. Gilead remained across the Jordan. And why did Dan stay in ships? Asher sat at the seashore and remained by its landings. Zebulun was a people who despised their lives even to death. And Naphtali also on the high places of the field. Now here... Here is the listing of those tribes that volunteered to serve in the army as well as those who refused to help. Okay, Six loyal tribes are praised and four absentees are taunted. Okay, uh, The heart searching of the tribe of Reuben was them trying to decide if they would help or not. But in the end, they failed to aid Deborah and Barak against the Canaanites. Thus, we see several tribes who appear to have refused to join in the battle against Sisera. Reuben, Gilead, Dan, and Asher, they're all uh, uh, pointed out by name that they refused to help. Now, many are kept from doing their duty by the fear of trouble, the love of ease, and undue affection to their worldly business and advantage with the Canaanites. All seek their own. Now keep in mind that during this period in history, every man did that which was right in his own eyes, as we see later in Judges 21, verse 25. That was the thought. Everyone did what they felt was right. Does that sound familiar? What was right to them? What they felt like was the best thing to do or what they felt like they wanted to do or what was right for them. <coughs> That is a prevailing thought even today. <coughs> Excuse me. Those that did not, that did join in the fight, they risked their own lives for the cause. And that's what that last statement there in, in 18, uh, they despised their li lives even to death, even unto death. They were willing to risk their lives. Now we come to verse 19. The kings came and fought, then fought the kings of Canaan at Tanak near the waters of Megiddo. They took no plunder in silver. The stars fought, fought from heaven. From their courses they fought against Sisera. The torrent of Kishon swept them away. The ancient torrent, the torrent Kishon. O oh my soul, march on with strength. Then the horse's hoofs beat from the dashing, the dashing of his valiant steeds. Curse Meros, said the angel of the Lord. Utterly curse its inhabitants, because they did not come to help of the Lord, to the help of the Lord against the warriors. Now here in verse 19 through 23, we have gotten to the battle itself, okay? Tanak and Megiddo were are areas on the western side of the Jezreel Valley where this took place. In verse 20 is referring to the weather being on Israel's side, that it was raining. Look back to verse 4 where the clouds dripped and the rain favored Israel because it made it difficult for the horses and chariots of Sisera's army. It can also be poetic language that Israel's help was coming from above, from the Lord and his workings. Okay, so it can do it can be on both. Evidently, the understanding of the Lord going before Barak and the ten thousand warriors could be the rain and the flooding <clears throat> that took place at the Kishon River, swell as 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 it swelled up. Thus, the Lord using His creation to work against Sisera and nullifying his strength in his chariots. So God was able to use his creation, the rain, the clouds, the mud, the river, everything, to go against and to nullify uh, the strength of Sisera's army. Now the occurrence of a flood also would explain why Sisera fled on foot, as we saw that last week. 
for under normally dry conditions, he would have been able to escape faster on his chariot, but not if his chariot was stuck in the mud. <clears throat> Surely Barak and the troops witnessed this divine intervention, and it gave strength to their souls to fight on. Now fully convinced that the battle was Jehovah's, and that he had indeed given the enemy into their hand. And God is in the business of strengthening our souls, is he not? Verse 22, the horses are hindered. They're just hindered because they cannot pull those chariots through the mud and even some being swept away into the river because it was flooded. Verse 23, then we have judgment being spoken down to a particular city who would not come and help in the fight. Now this curse was called down upon Meros by the angel of the Lord. Now we understand that is the pre-incarnate Jesus, okay? Now, I was thinking through this, woe to them that are cursed by God himself. Now you can have other people curse you in the name of the Lord, different things like that, but when God curses you, that's some serious cursing because He's God. He has the power truly to curse. And Meros, interestingly, was in the area of the tribe of Naphtali. So that may have been kind of a little bit of a discouragement to, um, to Barak, who was from that, that area in, in, and of that tribe. But in this last verse, uh, we also see the last verse here in verse, in, um, verse 23. Um, we also, speaking of this curse, we also see the fiery passion of Deborah as she is singing this song. Uh, so that kind of comes into play. And you have to think about this. This is something that is almost spontaneous by Deborah, wanting to share what God has done. And, and, and it's just, it's kind of a spontaneous, but then it shows the fieriness in her as well. As we come to verse 24, we come to Jael finally. Most blessed of women is Jael, the wife of Heber the Kenite. Most blessed is she of women in the tent. He asked for water, and she gave him milk. In a magnificent bowl, she brought him curds. She reached out her hand for the tent peg and her right hand for the workman's hammer. Then she struck Sisera. She smashed his head, and she shattered and pierced his temple. Between her feet he bowed, he fell, he lay. Between her feet he bowed, he fell. Where he bowed, there he fell dead. Now, here we come to the actions of Jael, as we said. Now, some people are very harsh and claim that Jael is simply a murderer. Okay, she lured Sisera into her tent only to trick him and then kill him. But God says, God's word says otherwise, doesn't it? I think I'm going to... I'm going to side on God's word here. God said she is most blessed of women, okay? Similar to what is said of Mary by the angel Gabriel, if you might remember that. Now, remember, we have to remember, this is war, okay? And Sisera was the enemy of God. So her actions are justified. Interestingly, it was the woman's job to set up the tent. So therefore, Jael would be very familiar with a tent peg and a hammer and know how to use it. Now, it says in the, in the scripture, he asked for water, but she gave Sisera milk. Now, this could be seen as not only, um, not only water, but nourishing milk that was given him to comfort him uh, and maybe make him feel more at ease in her tent. Uh, he could relax more, and thus she lulled him to sleep. Then she killed him with the tools that she was familiar with and that she had. Now, think about this with me. Like Shamgar and the ox gold that he had, God was able to accomplish a great task using someone who was not a warrior and using what they were familiar with even though it was not a normal weapon. Ox gold's not a normal weapon, okay, that you use in war. Uh, a hammer and a tent peg, it's not a normal weapon 
that is used in war. And yet God was able to use Shamgar and use Jael to accomplish a great task and, and defeat an enemy uh, with things, people that are not warrior and things that are not normal weapons because God was behind them. Now in verse 28, we continue with this. Out of the window she looked and lamented, the mother of Sisera through the lattice. Why does his chariot delay in coming? Why do the hoofbeats of his chariots tarry? Her wise princesses would answer her. Indeed, she repeats her words to herself. Are they not finding, are they not dividing the spoil? A maiden, two maidens for every warrior. To Sisera, a spoil of dyed work, a spoil of dyed work embroidered. Dyed work of double embroidery on the neck of the spoiler. Now here in verse 28, we have a big change in the song. Now we are seeing the mother of Sisera who is realizing that her son is dead. And she's trying to con finally convince herself that's what's happened. But she's struggling with that. No longer will she see him and no longer will he be the victor and divide the spoils of war. Now, Sisera's mother is a tragic counterpart to Deborah. They are both mothers in Israel. What a pathetic picture, though, of hope looking out uh, this window. It's a picture of hope where there is no hope. And there's a lot of people today that are looking out of a window, okay, of false assumptions and expecting something to happen that will never happen. Their hope is in something or someone that is not true, that is not holy, that is not right. Cicero was dead, and he would never come home to his mother's love again. And his mother and her attendants kept telling themselves and each other that everything was fine. But it wasn't. Now, verse 30 is a stark reminder of what Sisera would have done to the women of Israel had he won the battle. Remember, this was an evil Canaanite man who served false gods where, in their thinking, perverse practices were accepted and glorified. He was an enemy of God's people and thus an enemy of God. Verse 31, Thus let all your enemies perish, O Lord, but let those who love him be like the rising of the sun in its might. And the land was undisturbed for 40 years. Verse 31, May all of God's enemies perish as Sisera perished. Okay, This verse seems to take the form of a prayerful prophecy for indeed, one day future, all the enemies of Jehovah will be put to shame and will perish under his mighty hand. The fate of Sisera is a foreshadowing of what will someday happen to all the Lord's enemies. The prayer is that they would all perish like Sisera. As the psalmist records in Psalm chapter 2, uh, verse 10 and 12, Now then, you kings, act wisely. Be warned, you rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with reverent fear and rejoice with trembling. Submit to God's royal son or he will become angry and you will be destroyed in the midst of all your activities. For his anger flares up in an instant, but what joy for all who take refuge in him. Cursing of enemies in this way had been common since the time of Moses. You can look back to Numbers chapter 10 verse 35 and even in Psalm 68 verses 1 through 3. At its best, it was not motivated by personal vindictiveness, but by a recognition that judgment belonged to God and that his honor was bound up with the fate of his people. Now, if you'll notice in there, thus let your enemies perish, O Lord, but, but, this here is the transition from an enemy of God to those who follow and love him. Let those who love him be like the rising of the sun in its might. Okay, here we have the strength and the glory, just like the rising of the sun in all its brilliance. Paul writes about the reward, the reward 
of those who love and follow the Lord in 2 Timothy 4, 8. He says, and now the prize awaits me, the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on the day of his return. And the prize is not just for me, but for all who eagerly look forward to his appearing. So he's talking about those who follow the Lord, what God is going to give us. Of course, we know that the wonderful life that he gives us here and the joy and the peace that we have, but that's nowhere near the joy and the awesomeness that we will experience in heaven when we are face to face with our Lord and Savior. And the land was undisturbed for 40 years. 40 years of rest God gave to Israel, okay, after this. Now the song of Deborah teaches us to ascribe all glory in our successes to God. It is he who has given us strength to accomplish what we accomplish and has given us the victories in our lives. Deborah writes this in exuberance for how God has delivered his people from the oppression of the Canaanites, and all the praise goes to God. Even as she lists those that whom he used, all the praise still goes to God because she understands he's the one that, that did it. Deborah acknowledged that it was God who spoke to her and gave her the military strategy. It was God who promised he would give them the victory before they even gathered for battle. It was God who went before Israel to gain the victory. It was God who sent the rain that caused the flood, that caused the mud, that caused the horses and chariots of iron to be useless for Sisera's army. And it was God who sent Sisera to Jael's tent. It was God who guided Jael to kill the enemy of Israel who was oppressing them. So God gained the victory. God redeemed his people and God gave them rest from their enemies. And that's the song of Deborah. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you uh, again for your word and our time to be able to study it. I pray that uh, You've been able to use this time in our study in the way that brings you glory and honor. And we thank you, God, for how you brought the victory for your people through Deborah and Barak and Jael. And God, we pray that as we have studied this, Lord, that you will continue through your Holy Spirit to give us understanding of how it applies to our lives. But Lord, we can rejoice with Deborah in knowing that you truly are God and you are the one that works in our lives and gives us the victories and uh, we give you all praise for that and i just pray that you will continue to guide us as we continue to study in your word and uh, pray these things jesus in your name amen once again thank you for joining me and i uh, hope you've enjoyed the study tonight uh, next week we'll go into chapter six uh where unfortunately uh Israel does, again, does evil in the sight of the Lord. And then they are going to be oppressed by Midian. And we will see what the Midianites do uh, next time when we get together in Judges chapter 6. Until then, hope that you will stay healthy, stay safe, and hope you will join us uh, for our worship on Sunday morning. If you have a chance, come out and meet us out here tomorrow on Thursday at... at uh, 12 o'clock, every Thursday, 12 o'clock, we come out for our praying on the property and uh, just praying that God will continue to guide us and direct us and everything. As you might can tell, if you zoom in a little bit, uh, a lot of the, out, out, the siding on the outside up front has been finished or is almost finished as they are putting the final touches on it. I see the ladder still there, uh, but really exciting what all is going on. But... Uh, Hope that uh, you've enjoyed it, and I hope to see you on Sunday. Until, God bless you.